Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of uh, History for Role Players. Today we'll specifically talk about the Celts, or more to the point, Celtic Druids. Now the Celts are very interesting because they began as a people somewhere in the Neolithic age around 7000 BC. It's about the time when Homo sapiens, fancy way of saying thinking man, switched into Homo sapiens sapiens. In case you're wondering, we now are Homo Machina, the man-machine age. Now the Celts started appearing as Europe grew warm. So we just got out of an ice age and there was still glacial ice in much of northern Europe until 10,000 BC. And it stunted any rapid growth of civilization there. The animals as well had to return. Uh, some of them, the aurochs and the mammoths, they didn't return. With the ice melt, uh, ice age melt, uh, moisture also returned to Europe and the riv rivers as well became warmer and rains uh, became gentler. That allowed uh, more seasonal grazing by the animals and more hunting and gathering that could be collected. And especially uh, Europeans, they were, uh, they were fishermen. So as the rivers became more warmer and the fish returned, uh, there was a, in a, more of a, a um, a predictable nature of collecting uh, uh, food and food without food you have no man so what's interesting about the Celts and you can also pronounce them Celts uh, they're both correct uh, the Celtic people are joined by a language yet they thrived in both central Turkey and Western Spain northern Italy and most of Western Europe, which would be France and Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria now. Basically, they were in any place that wasn't considered classically civilized. Now, I don't use that term civilized as a pejorative, nor as the Celts um, as uncivilized. The Celts certainly had a very vibrant civilization. But when Western civilization was taught, they tended to neglect the Celts as they had neglected many different people. Um, the Celts themselves, and you're going to hear me pronounce it as both Celts and Celts, please don't let that be confusing. It's just, it's just my Jersey drawl sometimes getting in. The best, uh, the Celts were a people that could probably be considered to have conducted the best tactical retreat the world has ever seen. There's even evidence that during the last Ice Age, Celtic people crossed Greenland to enter North America. They might also have rafted the entire Atlantic like the Polynesian people and uh, did in the Pacific, and as Thor Heyerdahl with his Contiki proved, that you actually could cross the Atlantic in a, um, in a papyrus boat, as the Egypt might have done as they moved to Central America. Those are all theories, by the way. So what do we have as a role play perspective? We have that um, basically um, the um, Celts were a people that were hated as low life. They were not seen as uh, civilized people by the Greeks and the Romans, the Persians and the different, the Minoans, and even the Egyptians, which they all came in contact with. Um, they, uh, they may even in your fantasy campaign be some form of non-human. And it's probably those one hit die starting character barbarians who are mostly your, your uh, selves. Uh, certainly Conan fought his share of blue painted picks in his stories. Now the Celts were based uh, mostly on a clan and family ties. It, uh, it had formed their uh, system of government. And they were overseen by a matriarchy, uh, mostly female priests. Now later devotees, as, uh, as when we start getting into the AD region of the Celts, uh, more you would see more male druids uh, and also with male druids came human sacrifice and cannibalism. But these uh, beliefs I can see more as an outside contagion. A contagion. The druids themselves worshipped nature. And they relied on nature for their food. They relied on nature not to punish their people. They relied on nature to build their, their hut structures. They relied on nature entirely. And the whole matriarchy of the female priests as a protector of Mother Earth was definitely at the center of uh, Celtic society. The Celts were a people who uh, always moved away from threats. Now, occasionally they banded together to try to beat back peoples, but unfortunately the history of that was that they weren't very successful at it. Um, they were essentially unlucky people uh, when it came to fighting battles. Perhaps they were more lucky in love, but, you know, we can't really... Uh, there isn't much evidence of that. The 
the Celts in general were seen as uh, naked warriors uh, and they didn't really stand much of a chance against armored people. They armored themselves in the terrain. What happened was that the Celts constantly were moving into places that other classically more civilized nations would never dare to tread. Yet the Celts themselves found both protection in these harsher environments and a natural affinity with the uh, wildlife and the rugged terrain there. And that also could be bringing out of a, a Druid tradition that even as you travel further north into more harsher climes, you, uh, you still could survive and depend upon nature and Mother Earth to be that provider. Uh, the Romans uh, even got so frustrated with the uh, Pictish people of uh, Britain that they built a wall across the entire uh, um, uh, strait. Uh, Hadrian's Wall. I think uh, it's mostly in ruins today, but you can certainly uh, do a Google and, and find out about that. But that again, I think, is more where we're, uh, we're pushing uh, into where Hollywood would pick up with the Celts uh, with the Roman era. But the Celts uh, were a vibrant uh, civilization long before the Romans were trying to drive them into extinction. Now, the Celts are not the Vikings. They are not Danish or Germanic in origin. They do not share uh, a Germanic la a language. The Celtic language can be seen in sort of the uh, dialects of the Irish or the Welsh today, a little bit on the Scottish, although Scottish had more of an Anglo and Saxon influence uh, since they, they had to battle them for so many years. The Celts, uh, did not, uh, the Celts did not worship natural elements like most of the other pagan pan um, pantheons. They were not um, ones who saw the fire deity or the, the four winds or uh, the giants of the, of the Norse tradition. They had basically a monotheistic religion that worshipped the earth as a deity, as a provider. There were a number of lesser heroes that appear in their traditions, but mostly their folk tales concentrated on their ancestors, which they also had sort of as a Taoist uh, uh, tradition of worshiping and admiring ancestors. And uh, they fully expected that the people that they would see in their dreams uh, would be their ancestors, either advising them or warning them or comforting them. And uh, this is very useful for fantasy because the whole idea that both quests and uh, decisions could be made after sleeping for the evening as the players uh, you know, uh, rest and recover their magic and wounds. They could be visited by uh, Celtic ancestors or they could be visited by the Celtic people that whose territory they're uh, traveling through, adventuring through, either as a warning to uh, tread lightly and not violate certain norms or as a warning that uh, they're entering holy lands that uh, that the gods themselves are protecting, the gods themselves, that Mother Earth is protecting, and the Druids themselves are protecting. Now occasionally you see the, the Celts as a people uprise and try to push out intruders, but they, they fled the Persians, they fled the Greeks, they fled the Romans. Eventually the Romans damn near committed genocide on the Celts, but they managed to retreat even further to uh, Scotland and Ireland. What was left then faced the German and Danish peoples, reducing them to pretty much just the Welsh and Irish that you could see uh, remnants of their language and traditions today. Now there are many people who actually make claimants to that line, uh, lineage. Uh, certainly the Bo uh, Boston fans like to pronounce uh, it as the Boston Celtics uh, and not the Boston Celtics. But uh, actually, uh, you know, it, it, there, there, is, there is some evidence that a Celtic style people arrived in um, North America, but they did not carry on their traditions. Or their traditions were blended with the peoples that were also living there prior to that last ice age. And uh, um, the K sound in the Celtic uh, tradition is very important. And it tends to skip around as the tribes tended to assimilate. Uh, again, I don't want to uh, intend any malice in any of these discussions. It's just a matter of fact, me talking. Uh, but the civilized peoples uh, in history, uh, they tended to avoid a K sound where the, uh, the Celtic people tend to have tended to embrace it, except in certain places where the Celts had to deal with uh, their Latin counterparts. But before I get again, as I probably will say often, if before I get too far into the weeds or too far out of board, I'm trying not to 
give a dry dissertation of, uh, of historical elements. I more just want to try to explain how history can be integrated into your roleplay games. And the first is you need to look at the whole Druid tradition. Now the Druids would not be a people that should embrace any sort of armors, armor, and they should, their weapons should probably be based more in nature themselves as well. So we, let's look at a few of the practical advances that the Druids and the Celts brought in. And the first was the canoe. It, it seems like it's a very uh, practical device to be able to get on the water, especially to do any sort of deep lake fishing or even get further out from the coast. Yet the canoe was a, was a very marvelous thing. You also see it in North America, which tends to suggest that maybe the Celts did come there and, and, and integrate. The canoe, uh, followed by a division of labor, people were actually born into a class system in which they would you know they would either be the warrior select that would go for hunting or they would be a fishing cast that would help provide when when our year round they're fishing or they would try to cultivate the natural crops that grew along the streams now their settlements were mostly elevated houses a very little brick and very little of that actually uh, exists today but they were very solid as proof against the elements uh, the thing about uh, wood is it's a more natural insulator than stone. You can take up to 10 feet thick of stone and it will vent more energy than just a few inches of board. So they were essentially living in long, in long um, communal huts. Uh, they did create their own uh, forms of pottery. Uh, there is some argument that some of the pottery was imported, but from the diverse nature of the pot pottery of the Celts, uh, if it was imported, it was certainly uh, um, perfected. And uh, the, uh, the pottery allows them to uh, um, store both grains year-round and also their, uh, their tools and, and uh, um, uh, the mud from the creek to help reinforce the foundations in their homes. And uh, there were lots of pots uh, buried among their uh, 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 cer uh, cem um, cemeteries. And uh, uh, some people even refer to them as the Urnfield people because of this but they were essentially a flint and stone tool people. There is one exception, the battle axe. Now the battle axe would eventually turn into a bronze as bronze could be acquired or iron as iron could be acquired. But the, the, um, even though they lived mostly in a forest environment, they did not destroy the forest in order to turn it into charcoal to produce a vast amount of metals. Uh, later on, when they had to deal with civilized peoples, you can see them sort of uh, increasing the amount of metal that they would produce, but early on the battle axe itself would just be a large, a large shaped um, um, flint or shale uh, that would be fashioned onto um, a large mallet. Celts also domesticated dogs and horses. They might have been some of the first actually to domesticate horses, and that technique then was shared, especially when they were in, uh, in the Turkish region of um, Asia Minor and they had farming but the farming came as a secondary nature they didn't really cultivate the streams and along the stream beds like the egyptians did or the um, uh, people of the indus valley did or the uh, babylonians along the uh, tigris and euphrates so we have fishing a division of labor pottery flint and stone tools in a fantasy setting you almost want your druids to forego anything to do with metal and none of their spells and and uh, blessings should actually affect uh, uh, metal in general they should be uh, traditional peoples who can defend the party with their own magics especially whenever they weave and wicker or provide with ceramic and you could have your druids uh, coming forward with, um, with pottery as um, both an instrument of war you they can throw the pottery and it would as it lands it would break and explode with all sorts of um, uh, spores that are collected from the forest, uh, poisonous fungi, uh, smokes, uh, hallucinogenic substances, and oils and fires, pitches that can be uh, collected from the swampish regions. So when you're starting to deal in a fantasy element, you also have to start to think about the Druids and the Celts and the environments they live in, and there's a natural relation that they would have with the fairy folk. Now we're also talking leprechauns and will-o'-wisps, sprites and pixies. These are all these domains where the Celtic people uh, would be seen as charming humans as opposed to destructive humans. The other thing the Celts did was they were one of the first to realize that if you put 
uh, beer, just normally uh, um, yeast fermented uh, grains or yeast fermented sugars into a bowl and then heat that bowl that the steam that came off of it would be more concentrated in alcohol. Now, without going too much into the chemistry, uh, the boiling point of um, ethanol is lower than that of water. So as you heat up an ethanol uh, a water mixture, as you would with just uh, uh, yeast-based uh, beer, you would essentially be able to distill off in, a, in an alembic sort of boil. Uh, you could collect that uh, condensation uh, with another pot and then that pure uh, uh, nectar that would come off from the condensate is highly alcoholic. In a fantasy realm it's easy to see how the uh, the drunken fae, those drunken fairies, would start to share their secrets with mankind when uh, men like the druids and the Celts would come forward blessed with these silver tongues as they would say able to spin their bar bardic tales and tell their untruths to the uh, to the fae maidens after they get them drunk. But if we uh, continue on and leave that behind before it gets too tawdry, let's talk about uh, the mother goddess of fertility. Now the life expectancy of children was always very low in the, in the uh, ancient world, almost even up to the modern world. Uh, women would have a number of children and uh, a childbirth itself could be very dangerous to the woman but the life expectancy of the children was horrific. And this is, plus the, the Celts as a people, because they were more that were uh, lovers, not fighters, they lost a lot of their um, uh, members to slave states because they were always so surrounded by slave states. In Spain, they had to deal with the uh, Phoenician Carthaginians and then later the Romans. In Turkey, gosh, there were probably 10 or 12, including the Assyrians, the most violent people that ever had a civilized. There were lots of violent people. The Huns were terribly violent, but the Huns were not really city builders. The Assyrians were violent and they were city builders, which is sort of a vicious uh, combination. But the, um, the Celts were constantly being raided uh, as slaves. And uh, uh, plus, with children, children are, were, were always seen as sort of a retirement fa um, plan of a family unit. So if you have a clan sort of family base, um, you would, uh, children would be very important to the tribes. So worshiping a mother goddess and a mother goddess that provides fertility would be very important. A woman who could have children, especially children that would be healthy and survive to adulthood, and that woman would be revered. Uh, also, you'll find in the uh, Celtic tradition, there was uh, Epona, Epona, forgive me if, if the inflection is wrong, uh, and uh, Epona was a goddess of horses, and the horse was seen as unlocking magical portals into the realms of the Fae. The horse would uh, extend a nomadic tribe immensely. When you have horses to carry the burden or drag um, your uh, tents, uh, drag your, your pottery along behind, uh, you and by horseback you could certainly probably get a hundred miles a day where walking you only need to get 20. The horses being able to unlock these magical portals would be seen as a natural extension of the stamina of the horse. The Celts were also a people who um, used chariots and even though the chariots was not a true wagon uh, it did extend the uh, the usefulness of the horse and allowed it to uh, pull a lot more weight and um, again, with the pottery, you, were, you could move your whole civilization with uh, chariots a, a lot faster than most of the walking armies pursuing you. There also, with the domestication of the dog, you find that the mystic hound appears a lot in the uh, Celtic tradition, and the hound is the protector of sleep in the, in the uh, Celtic tradition, and this is very natural. You can see how if you have dogs in your camp, the dogs would warn you of danger. At this time, you'd still want to have bears and mountain lions and uh, uh, very rarely mammoths. Again, that's more of an agrarian type of creature anyway. Most of those were killed and eaten long before the Celts were spreading out through Europe. But they would also uh, warn when man came. And there was a, uh, a jealousy and transformation of people into animals with some of the themes of the religion. They wanted to avoid jealousy. If you're dealing in a communal sort of uh, nature where everyone is, is just a few uh, uh, generations apart and just a, uh, a few uh, um, strands of the 
of, of the family tree away from one another. You don't want to have any jealousy. Jealousy can lead to arguments and splitting the family, which would just weaken the tribe in general. And again, the fae, uh, the magical fae, the magical elf would, seem as the, would be seen as the mischief makers who would cause the jealousy or would transform people into animals that would uh, terrorize the, uh, the forest for a little while. They talked a lot about an other world. The other world is sort of an ageless place. And uh, you could go off to the other world and come back and 300 years would have passed. And yet you only thought you were there as a day. This works really well in a fantasy realm where people can be separated for just a little while and come back and find that everything has changed. You could either take a party into the other world and have it come back and change your campaign greatly to respond to that, or you could have uh, uh, somebody go away for a little while, come back, and not recognize, as an NPC, not recognize the world that he left and coming back to. Uh, the, pin, the pig and the swan become uh, uh, figures that you see on, on some of their metalwork or uh, some of their stone carving. Uh, they represent more of a, a, a new food supply that was evolving with the religion. Pigs especially are high, high contact, uh, high calorie content for a small animal compared to what it eats, which is almost anything. A pig should, could certainly be uh, ringed through their nose and then uh, put on a, on a leash. Or you can just basically release the pig and it, will, uh, it won't roam that far. It's like having livestock without having pens. And uh, there was always a belief that the uh, that the traveler, especially the outside traveler, was could bring famine at any time. So the Celts did not like to associate with them. Um, you know, they weren't they weren't very big big with trade because they did not want outsiders to enter their domains. The, the outsiders probably were more malicious, cutting down trees and uh, building, and um, especially the Romans making roads, all that would be offensive to the Druid Celtic lifestyle. There were a number of sacred wells and springs that appear in their traditions. Uh, this would probably attest to the fact there was always difficulty year-round finding water uh, as sources, especially in the mountains in which they were chased, or the fetid swamps and salt flats that, um, as they would say, no civilized person would enter. So if uh, the, in the stories, the traditional springs and wells, the Celts as well might be in an area in your fantasy campaign where only they know where the springs are drinkable. And if anyone, like the party ventures enter the area, they're constantly being uh, thirsting for water, and all the water they're finding they can't, uh, they can't drink. I know in some fantasy games you have the um, purification of water spells or the conjuring of waters and those would be again something the druids would be able to do to comfort the party or even threaten the party you know leave and as a reward we'll give you this or if you don't leave we're going to transmute your own water into something undrinkable. Uh, birds were seen as tricksters. Now normally birds were admired in the ancient world because the, the idea of flight was so amazing but here they were seen as something that was uh, that was um, and bad in spirit, uh, more of the el uh, elf and impish quality. Uh, birds were seen to actually lure, uh, turn into women and lure men away, and uh, they would bring uh, madness, and uh, just by hearing the laugh of certain birds, uh, men would be driven insane. It's tough to realize where that might have come from, except for the fact that if you're, uh, if you're in an area with a lot of magpies and a lot of very vocal birds, uh, it can definitely be disruptive, especially uh, you know, on sleep, or you, you might plant uh, some sort of grain crop only to see it destroyed by birds, and that, of course, would not, uh, would not bode well for a, a, a farming and uh, hunting and gathering society. There was definitely a sanctity in the home, a shared home. It was all communal. The gods uh, would freely give succor and nourishment. However, they would always punish thievery. So there's a number of uh, Celtic stories of how uh, families would welcome in strangers, and it was always a cautionary tale. It was mostly designed to warn uh, the Celtic people uh, in general not to welcome strangers, to don't be generous with your uh, foodstuffs. But if you were, uh, the gods would reward you with more nourishment. However, if the thief ever took anything else from the home, then the gods would come back to punish. And you could sort of see the same thing of the druid culture in the, in a fantasy world. They would freely offer sustenance to a party of players, but if that party of players were to try to rob or steal from them, then other tribes in the area would just be incensed by that. Whenever you uh, you, sh you share and then have that um, that sharing be betrayed, it would definitely you know bring an arousal from, from different peoples. Uh, a little bit of that in Game of Thrones, you might have remembered where uh, 
anyone that's invited into the home, they share salt with them. If you break that trust of the home, uh, you're going to be punished later. Probably enter a home and, and enjoy the stew or the beard, but uh, if you touch any of the gold they have, you die. And trust me, there wasn't a whole lot of gold or silver in the ancient world that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of it would be hidden underground, even after it's found. Uh, you needed to leave the possessions of the people alone. Uh, you also find in the Celtic language very interesting that the, a lot of their words, especially their pronouns, have no gender, or actually blend gender. Uh, one word could actually mean son or mother, or the two joined as a babe, babe in arms. And so that as well could call into the, uh, the Druidic tradition that uh, uh, all the Druids are sexless or polyamorous as the modern term would be. The Druids only, the Druids, Celtic peoples, only had an oral tradition. They didn't really have anything written down. Uh, and their religion was definitely uh, based in spellcraft. There were actually few inhabited centers of religion. There were, um, there were a number of monolith sites, which the Celtics were the ones, the Celts Celtics were the ones that erected. But they were not, um, they were not actually tended around uh, year round. They actually seemed with fear. And only during certain times and ceremonies would they come and uh, and try to conjure magic to protect the tribes. Stonehenge is a big calendar, mostly to predict um, uh, eclipses. It um, in the ancient world again, they, the people would not want to to be around that for fear that they would be driven insane by the magic that exists there. Uh, the Stonehenge and the erecting of the stones was, was seen as a place that can amplify magic, and this can come into your fantasy campaign that perhaps as the players enter an area with these erected stones they can use uh, spells of more advanced nature yet would have uh, less chance of controlling them and have more chance of, of misfire. Now uh, Stonehenge in general is again it's a calendar based monolith and the eclipse had great significance and uh, nobody in the ancient world fully understood that occasionally the moon would pass between the earth and the sun and block it out. That was just something that was not seen, even in the Ptolemaic uh, tradition, with all of these circles within circles trying to explain how the earth as the center of the universe and the sun which revolves around it, how any of these things happen was still a complex mathematics and hard to explain. In a uh, people like the Celts, whenever the eclipse happened, uh, and most eclipses will happen for several minutes, and during that time there would just be the sense of, will it ever stop? Is the world always going to be plunged in darkness? What's going to happen to our crops? What's going to happen to us? So to predict those events certainly would have a spiritual element and also give the, uh, uh, the more practical druids a power over the people and tribes that they that they tended to. In a fantasy uh, domain, certain things should be able to happen during eclipses and only happen during eclipses when uh, a, a moon or a, a sun is prevented from casting its gaze down on the world. The people who um, lived around a lot of these monoliths, they, um, they, they thought they could predict and explain nature. And their explanations were actually very complex, not simplistic. And the more complex they were, the more the Druid would be consulted. Uh, there was also, um, the Druids uh, had a great sense of divination. They were able to do a lot of predicting. And um, the oak tree was very central. And if there was any sort of religions, religious center or altar, it would be around the oak tree. The, the oak tree, uh, when, especially when it grows really, really old, or has been affected by the elements hit by lightning, or uh, starved for water during uh, certain times, or was displaced by uh, the movement of a river, uh, you can actually see how craggy they get and you can you can make out faces in the bark of oak trees that's why they would be significant the druids were the ones that taught the warriors how to fight so the druids actually represent more of a monkish style um, uh, eastern philosophy of being the uh, warrior priest and they especially were the ones that could instill bravery on the battlefield they uh, they also uh, through the use of holly which is a slightly thorny um, plant and through um, other um, types of blessings of, of tree and branches, they could uh, provide their warriors with invulnerability. But they would always caveat in that it was both for those who were worthy and there was an expiration date on it. And in the, uh, in the more fantasy uh, role-playing element, uh, you can easily count down that expiration date or make the people uh, prove their gallantry in order to maintain their invulnerability. Or the druids they're fighting would just, when they first meet them, 
you know, take your best shot and they would be invulnerable to it. And then the players would probably think that that uh, invulnerability would last forever when it was only maybe for that first shot that they took just as a uh, proving that uh, you don't want to mess with me. Uh, there was a lot of singing in the Druid tradition, and the voice of the Druids actually probably transitions into the Bards. The Celtic people were one of the, the first, along with the uh, Phrygians, to develop a, um, a tonal scale where they knew certain pitches of sounds when sung together would sound even more wonderful. And of course, the, uh, the singing themselves was sought uh, both as a religious prayer and as an inspiration on the battlefield. The Druids did a lot of blessing of weapons for a limited amount of times, especially later on when metal starts to appear. They could be able to bless the people and bless the, uh, the weapons that they, that they carried. A weapon. And these blessings would be things like, um, this weapon will not uh, lose your, leave your hand during battle, or this weapon would not break in battle. This weapon will, uh, will not draw blood and will only injure the opponent, won't kill if the, if the person was averse to that. And, of course, the circle was very important in the Druid tradition. If you fantasy uh, campaign, if the players come across a place with lots of oddly drawing circles, especially with arrows that point to the heaven or horizon, then they definitely are dealing with the Druid elements. So, the Celtic uh, concept of center is very important. They saw as a powerful charm the ring and both the ring in a macro form and the ring in a micro form and these should appear in your game as well the center of power in the human they they thought emanated from the belly button and that would tie back into their fertility god as well and through the fact that uh, when uh, when we're all born the umbilical cord must be cut from the mother uh, your quests uh, in a fantasy world they should be similar to the Celtics uh, tradition that they're, they were basically finding a challenge of finding a middle of some place. So a druid uh, in the fantasy game could be uh, telling the players that you're not actually looking for an object, you're not looking for a person, you're looking for a center. And that center could be metaphorical or could be actually just the center of a maze or the center of a, a grove of trees or geographically from where you are, how many feet and miles or leagues you need to move in order to move the center of a region. Uh, a lot of times uh, three became very important uh, at, this, at the, uh, the apex of the center point of three fields, the center point of three hills, the center point of three rivers. The root of the tree and the origin of magic, the strength of stone, uh, there was, the druids definitely had a, a, a focus to their traditional power. If you take away the focus from the druid, uh, he probably could, uh, would lose his sense of uh, trust in his own abilities. So all druids would be carrying something on them, whether it would be a, a stone ring around their neck or a, a branch from a certain uh, sacred tree. And if you can uh, take that away from them, you would have great power over the druid uh, that he would, you know, almost be begging for it to be returned. The whole idea of a round table in the Arthurian legend is actually a Celtic in origin of all men being able to see each other around the table and hear each other clearly around the table. When you look at more of a feasting type of environment, especially a Roman type of environment where there's going to have one person at the end of the table and his closest advisor to him, he might not even hear most of the people that are actually in the... Uh, gathering. And the harvest, of course, would be something, especially the, the, uh, the idea that when certain fish are spawning, that would definitely be seen as a, as a holy God-given uh, event of the year. And whenever there's a, a gathering, uh, the netting of the fish, uh, the riding of the river, those would all have a religious significance in the, both your game and in the uh, Celtic tradition. Now the Celtics, uh, the Celtic people also uh, had believed in the afterlife, strongly believed in the afterlife. When you deal in an ancient society with so much death from children, so much death from disease, outside elements, you would have to have some belief. You, you wouldn't be able to face your life. And they uh, were big barriers, uh, burials, uh, big on burials, but they did not do um, any sort of uh, desiccation uh, in the Egyptian fashion. They, they built no tomb, uh, tombs. They would bury above the ground in that they wouldn't dig into the earth to throw in the body and then cover it up. They would lay the bodies out, and sometimes even with a wood lattice to raise them up a little bit, and then they would cover them with dirt. And sometimes these were actually built to get the bodies above the bog, yet over time the bog would consume the mounds, and that lack of oxygen and that lack of decay that you get in bogs uh, definitely had a, a preservation element. And you can see this in a lot of um, mummies of the Celtic tradition that are still in museums today. But in a fantasy sense, there would be a whole range of new monsters 
that would be bog creatures, and they would be both a form of undead and a form of, uh, um, what is that classic example, the mud people, that when you stab them, you would lose your weapon in them, that would come up to big into play. If the Celts as a people, you're definitely going to have to say that they were one of the more stubborn races. Uh, they left little legacy of city and craft, but they were always on the fringes uh, of, um, essentially, always on the fringes, uh, fringes of, of more established civilizations and always disrupting those civilizations by migrating. I think most people viewed the Celts as an, an annoyance. And, that, and the Romans probably got to the point where they said, we just need to slaughter these people and get them out of the way because whenever they do come, in, in, come into the area, we're just, they're killing us uh, with their need for kindness. You should also definitely add a teaching element that the Fae or the Elves are, um, are basically in constant contact with the Celtic, Celtic people, especially the Druids. And uh, there would even be some uh, inter-race mingling, uh, mating of the Elves and the humans. Uh, they, this, certainly every half-elf, uh, one of the most popular characters in D&D, would be of a Dru uh, Druid um, Celtic type of tradition. Let's see, we got to, I got a little bit more here to talk about. Let me check my time really quick. Mm, only about half of the hour done. I'm going to go ahead and continue. You can always uh, pause this stuff, of course, and, and listen to it more at your leisure, and hopefully you are. So as we transition out of the, uh, the Neolithic Age, the, uh, the New Stone Age, um, and around 3500 BC you start hitting the Bronze Age and the, the Celts uh, are actually attributed by uh, many uh, of the contemporary historians as being the first metallurgists. Now this, I don't think this is necessarily true. Probably what happened was the Celts with their common language and their uh, the fact that they were spread so widely across Europe, they probably dealt with some of the first metallurgists and then then they used those objects and either brought those ar objects uh, in, in trade. Again, they're not really seen as a trading type of people, but they probably brought them in ceremony or uh, in ceremonial fashion where they buried them and then other civilizations dug those mounds up to take their weapons from them. There definitely is a lot of adornment of the dead bodies as they start getting into the Bronze Age. Uh, most of the possessions of a chieftain would be buried with him, and that would be uh, I, that would be definitely exhausting to the tribe to um, uh, have this king and have him as a center, or have this uh, queen, have her as a center, and then lose that king or queen, and then take some of the most prized possessions of the tribes and leave them behind. Now the Sumerians sort of had uh, four city-states that came together and uh, they, uh, they were wedding the gods of the sun and the moon and everything was personal nature and uh, everything was to do with man's vices. And when the Sumerian people came in contact with the Celtic people, I can see where they would probably see them, one, as very strong slaves. Uh, coming from more of a, uh, a hunter and gatherer society, and uh, two, a source of uh, warriors that could be recruited into these, uh, again, abuse the term, more civilized city dwelling peoples. But also, if you have a druid element, they would be um, brought in as some of the advisors or high priests of these actual other cultures. So the druids themselves, some of the more uh, uh, ambitious uh, druids would probably desert their own tribes or assimilate their own tribes into an area where they could obtain greater power. As we move out of the Bronze Age, and the Bronze Age was pretty much where we started to see copper and when they mixed copper with tin or copper with uh, zinc. Bronze and brass is heavy. It's very strong uh, but heavy. As we get into the Iron Age, you start to see where you really have a more advantage of having a lighter metal and a stronger metal. Uh, the Iron Age around 800 BC is definitely an age of murder. It starts with a, something that's called the Sea Peoples. Nobody knows what the Sea Peoples are. I do. The Celts had a natural affinity for boats and for river craft. That it's very easy to see that the uh, more outgoing and, and dramatic um, elements of the Celtic uh, um, peoples decided that they had had enough of being exploited, especially during those uh, 3,000 years of the Bronze Age, that they decided to take to the seas, land all throughout the Mediterranean, and slaughter. Now, some cases they actually assimilated, but mostly it was just an era of rampaging that the Celts, and you could probably add this into your own game, that, you know, if you beat on those poor, helpless, 
hippies living in the woods long enough, eventually their god or the fae themselves that guide them or just their own um, fed up and bru and, uh, and hardy nature of living in the elements would, uh, you know, all it takes is a sword in hand and slaughter can ensue. There's also an enormity of pagan traditions that get upset during the um, uh, Iron Age right at the start. And uh, there's a number of religions throughout the Mediterranean that suddenly have war gods uh, come into play and have uh, uh, other types of, uh, the, you know, the pantheons of a number of places become splintered by these sea peoples. And the sea peoples themselves, whoever they are, or if they're the Celts, would come into the area and as they conquered they would carry away the artifacts of those places and then where the artifacts would be traded or lost in other wars uh, it would bring questions to different uh, um, different traditions as as the artifacts of the Egyptians were lost to the Hittites as the Hittites artifacts were lost to the Assyrians and the Babylonians as uh, as different cultures were assimilated by the artifacts and by the treasure that was collected from their civilizations that were destroyed by the sea people, you would get uh, a number of religions that would start to say, well, who is this god on this disc? Or why is the eagle uh, inscribed on this sword? And everything about that would be seen as you know, a magical element, and it should be as well in your uh, role-playing games. The Irish people especially became even more brutal. Uh, it was said by tradition that the Irish would decide their king not by a hereditary uh, tradition, but they would have a contest and see who could be coupled to a mare the longest. And the person that stayed mounted on the animal the longest and mounted, I mean mounted on the animal for the longest, would actually become their king. And somebody with the prowess to do that, you could see, would probably be somebody who you could actually respect as a warlord king. Uh, they, the Celts started making huge pictographs, the type that you'd see also in uh, South America, where they would change the landscape. They would tear up the ground, and then they would salt it with um, uh, chalk or uh, calcium. And they would make these huge pictographs that could only be seen by the air, or only be seen by uh, uh, Roman forts. And I think that's more what they were. They weren't necessarily uh, pictographs of religious nation, of, of, of giants. They were there to sort of um, warn other people that, you know, this. Uh, there are people here that uh, will not take kindly to you um, stealing their possessions or enslaving their people. Come and join us, you know, for a beer or for a uh, stout beer with our Alembic processes, but don't you dare disrupt our society. The antler, um, you would think the antler as a, a goddess of fertility symbol would have actually come on uh, come into play more, but the, only until the Iron Age did you start to see the bone of the antler uh, being carved into uh, uh, various uh, um, religious icons and fetishes. This may also be the fact that only by the Iron Age the majority of Celts were starting to get uh, steel needles and things that uh, would normally be considered an item only held by the highest of nobility, uh, bronze combs, that sort of thing, were now being uh, produced and, and were held by uh, lower and lower peoples and they were using them as an artisan function to actually shape the ivory of the horn, the, the bone of the horn. And, uh, but again, it went back to that worship of the animals as important to the survival of the actual Celtic people. Uh, the Celts could be probably, without uh, any uh, irony, uh, said to be the first environmentalists. They were people who did not destroy the environment. They would uh, strive to be prolific, but it seems like there was a natural balance in that they did not uh, overpopulate the areas they were in, or certainly if they overpopulated, they, uh, they basically decided to expand south into areas where they met up with people that were uh, a little bit more brutal. So let's talk a little bit about the Celtic heroes. Uh, the Celtic heroes are, there might even been a section one time in, in the uh, gods and demigods type of books uh, where they listed all the Celtic heroes and they mixed them of course in with a lot of the um, Finnish heroes, the Danish heroes, and uh, Germanic heroes. The Celtic heroes were all fair of face, beardless, light of stride, bright of eyes. What does that sound like? Very feminine features. It sounds like elves. Because again, all the heroes were probably tales that were people were telling about meeting these fantastic fae people and uh, the marvelous adventures they went on. The uh, Celtic heroes had armor made of living vines or flowers. 
The heroes were pleasing and naturally perfumed. They were painted and rouged in cheek and lips. Uh, they bathed in fountains, scented fountains. Uh, there was a whole uh, sort of Arabian Nights feel uh, to the Celtic heroes and the Celtic stories. There were all these islands of adventure that the heroes would go on to. Uh, they, they would visit the other world and, and time would stand still for them, yet uh, ages would pass for the other people. There was a, a folklore involving nature and uh, the values of the people were definitely reflected in the heroes. Just as we had um, a Paul Bunyan and Johnny Appleseed, uh, Pecos Bill, uh, that represented sort of that wild uh, west independent tradition, the, uh, the Celtic heroes represented their own uh, tradition of uh, falling in love with the Fae, falling in love with, the, uh, with nature, and uh, depending upon nature for survival. Oizen, I think, is the way it's pronounced. Oizen is one of the fairies that uh, first, uh, or I should, should say, one of the first heroes that is, uh, falls in love with a fairy. And this tradition of, of Oizen uh, went all the way into the medieval world as well. They told these stories of Oizen falling for the fairy. Uh, Oizen was a beautiful man himself, yet he falls for an even more beautiful fairy. There was a, a, a number of heroes who, uh, who, who killed an enemy's horse after the battle for fear that the um, the animal would avenge its owner. That was again that um, Epona, uh, the goddess of the horse craft, uh, that the horse was become very important. This would be great for Outland because there's a whole section of swagger room devoted to the horse and if the hero should fall, the horse would protect him. In uh, Dungeons and Dragons, I think a lot of the mount uh, type of aspects are, are downplayed. It'd be nice if somebody uh, wrote some rules on that. And uh, uh, for other systems, again, um, when a, a person is on horseback, it's certainly seen in a fantasy world where it should appear more. Um, there was a mistrust of foreign s slaves. They brought uh, they brought foreign traditions, and uh, the slave uh, definitely changes the master. That's what, what was felt, and that's what actually happened by tradition. Uh, a lot of times, when slaves were brought in, they were, their uh, their ideas uh, would be uh, shared with, especially the children they taught. Just as the uh, saga of Odysseus um, is related to his vanity, uh, you also had a number of Celtic heroes who fall in love with um, mythical creatures on iron, iron on islands and then sacrifice their whole crew to remain there. Many of the heroes in the Celtic tradition are able to change shape, um, or they'll they'll be seen riding huge fish or changing into fish. They had a very um, it was very gnomish or fae. A lot of the uh, um, tale tellers that would come along and uh, describe in the stories what was happening. The guy would meet this gnomish figure who would put him on a quest. He'd meet a fae that he would fall in love with, and she would have tasks he'd want to do. A slaying of dragons was extremely popular, and actually the slaying of dragons was co-opted by the Christians. It was the Celtic people that really sort of introduced the dragon as this large lizard. Now, I don't know if there was any reptiles of any significant size, a, um, a kimono dragon of the European theater, but if, they, if we had one time large uh, bison, the oryx, and woolly mammoths, and um, uh, the mastodons are from North America, but if we had uh, large elephants, huge bears, I could see the fact that at one time there probably was a dragon slash reptile sort of element that, that became the proto-basin for the dragons. And of course the idea of a dragon is also another number one, uh, is also a nice metaphor because a lot of times um, chieftains would be uh, forced to swear allegiance by giving over their daughters to other stronger uh, nations. This happened all throughout the uh, Near East in the cultures of Turkey and Syria and uh, the Hittites and the uh, Lydians and even the Achaeans and the Minoans. And those would all be people that the Celts would have to deal with. So uh, if you're going to deal with a Celtic culture and fantasy, you're going to have uh, dragons. And again, I said they're co-opted by the Christians because a lot of Christian saints, uh, George especially, uh, he's not a biblical character in any nature. He's a Celtic hero that was co-opted to sort of add an affinity between the pagan traditions of the Celts and the Christian traditions that slowly took them over. And dragons, of course, as I said, are uh, very much an analog for the Romans or Germanic tribes who took political slaves as hostages. You'll find that uh, uh, Bran uh, becomes Bran the Blessed when the Christians start coming in, and Patrick, uh, who teaches his trinity using the shamrock, a god in three persons, exists in nature. Again, as the Christians came in to uh, proselytize the Celts, the pagan traditions were not fully expunged, 
they were basically transformed so that the people would have images that were traditional and yet see a greater a greater faith in the and the larger religion we brought in in the fantasy world i think you're going to see a lot of hold spells coming from the druids and what you're going to see with them is that in the celtic tradition of heroes the main heroes often watch their minions punished and again, this works out great in Outlands because you have a whole chart on your ship crew and to watch it swaggering get checked off one by one. Or, but uh, again, if you're if you have somebody in the party who's held and he has to witness the rest of the party getting devoured or or beaten beaten the bejesus out of, the, you always want at least one hero in the tale, a Celtic tale, to be paralyzed to represent the bard's point of view in the tale, especially when these are a lot of these were uh, long uh, poetic ballads and uh, you needed a perspective and the first person perspective was very powerful so they would sing and tell the story from from the perspective of a man who had to watch and endure. It also gave him an excuse of why he didn't fight and protect all his men. Oh, I was caught up by magic. Now, there, there is no written uh, tradition among the Celts. Uh, they did not make uh, the, the scrolls on papyrus. They did not generate uh, the cuneiform on clay. And you can see this as the fact that it was sort of an edict among the Druids that none of their spells, none of their secrets should be written down and stolen. And this should be true in the game as well. I think the spell book uh, concept in D&D sort of has some limitations here, but I don't want to malign the game, in that the Druids should not be... Um, uh, making a collection of scrolls to pass on their secrets. It should all be an oral tradition. You should be able to learn your druidic talents directly from the gods, directly from heroes, directly from other druids, but you would never want them to just be randomly finding them there. As we entered into the Iron Age and the other uh, other civilizations started to become dominant, you also see that the religion started to change from a monotheistic faith into a male-centric faith. A number of priests in the Druid tradition showed their devotion by self-sacrifice. If the crops had failed several times in a row, if the fish failed to spawn on a river, the Druid would bring back that spawn of fish simply by entering the river and drowning himself. I can almost admire somebody who has that much faith in his belief. In a modern world, I don't think any of us have this sort of devotion that you see in the ancient world. Let's see if we got anything else in here. Eventually the monastic system comes in. As the Roman system expands and then retracts, the monastic system, especially in Ireland, was what saved many of the ancient Greek texts, uh, texts and Roman plays. Without the guys in their, uh, in their sanctuaries looking up at the stars and slowly spending their life recopying these works into their own uh, languages and also just recopying them over into Latin and Greek. Uh, they protected civilization from totally disappearing in the Dark Age. And you'll find as well as we enter more into a medieval environment, maybe where your fantasy play comes into play, you'll find the tribes in warfare become extremely brutal. There was a point where there was no quarter. The Celts gave up on compromise, and they would start to fight to the death. Not only did they fight to the death, but when they would take the enemy, when they dismember the enemy, they didn't want the enemy to have any sort of respect after death. The Celts would start to come in, and they would slaughter whole foreign families. Anyone living on their in farmsteads, on the edges of their uh, woodlands, edges of their heaths, edges of their mountain and hill ranges, they would go in and they would basically uh, slaughter them. And uh, the Celts eventually uh, started to believe that women themselves, all women, had some form of, of witchcraft within them, and that the female species was monstrously evil. There's uh, a groups of uh, the Fomorians they talk about um, that are a monstrous race, evil and human misshapen, just one eye, very similar, I guess, to the Cyclops, huh? Three jaws of teeth. I don't even know how you can draw three jaws of teeth. Uh, but um, there was sort of a change in the idea as we move further into the Celtic traditions, Druid traditions. Maybe they felt betrayed that the Fae had let them down, that they had been conquered and enslaved so many times that they just wanted a backlash, they wanted revenge. And they started to hate the Fae themselves. They thought that the Fae uh, had brought a corruption by breeding with morals and had cursed uh, the Celts uh, by this intrusion and that uh, their uh, tribes were suffering from curses. Furbolg, uh, Furbolgs, Furbolgs is a D&D monster and many people, probably most people, don't realize that it was actually a tribe of Celts 
that was defeated on the island of uh, Ireland uh, around 200 BC and the battle was over the major city of Terra, one of the few uh, cities that uh, the Celts actually be, uh, built. So this uh, tribe, which you know essentially would be another surname, the Fir Bulgs, were after after they were defeated in 200 BC, a few hundred years later, they started to use uh, fur bulgs as a racial slur. But fur blogs would be a derogatory term. And now the fact that we uh, uh, we we just turn it into just a and d monster, some sort of troll creature, I just want to make a note to the politically conscious or overly conscious politically uh, crowd that they understand that a lot of the monsters in D&D actually derive from racial slurs. So. Those hated uh, troll or, uh, trollish uh, fur blogs or gothic vandals, they actually were real people at one time, so... He was without sin, throw the first stone. The sculptors of the area of the Celts uh, were starting to change their images to battle more, warriors carrying severed heads. Again, I think they're just massing the Marquisimo of the time. They're issuing warnings to anyone that should come along, that you've reached the extent of our patience. There, um, there definitely was more rivalry among the male persona of other civilizations. Uh, there's clashing with the female life giver as the protector of the Celts. There was anti-Druid campaigns that eventually evolved where uh, spellcasters were seen as naturally evil. All woods became haunted. These are all another aspect of your fantasy campaign. You don't have to actually base it in an ancient world, but these are the traditions you're dealing with when you say somebody is a druid in a woodlands. He wouldn't just be some guy who decided, you know, at the age of 18 that he had enough of civilization and decided to live out there in the, uh, in the wilds. These would be people that had given up many generations ago, and they're still living sort of that hunter-gatherer life and, and a solitude, and along come the players to disrupt that. Brothers would be forced by charmers to slay each other, it became very popular in the sagas, or uh, brothers would be seduced and slain by hags. There's a, 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 a long tale in Celtic tradition of a, a guy that sets the three with um, his sea with his three younger brothers, and the three younger brothers are nothing but trouble to him all along the way. Yet one by one they get, uh, they get killed or charmed or drowned or some other mishap coming to them. And by the time he realizes that his whole family has been, except for himself, has been uh, slaughtered by the ambition he had for travel. Again, it's a moral lesson. A lot of moral lessons appear in, in traditional sagas. Magic is seen as corrupting. Uh, it brought in new superstitions. Uh, and uh, they, uh, this whole fighter class of the neo-nobility that starts to come in with the feudal ages definitely wanted to get rid of all elements of pagan priesthood. The Christian faith, and with no malignance intended, uh, tended to support the idea that we render unto Caesar what is Caesar and we will uh, allow our kings to be uh, divinely inspired, divine, having divine rights. But the uh, pagan traditions which were being supplanted were looking at that, no, 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 it's nature that has the element that we should be worshipping, not any individual man. Well, off with this it. Uh, the eagle, you'll see it grows in importance as the Celts decline. The more eagles you see as uh, images, the less you're going to probably see a worshipping of nature anywhere. Even though, which is again funny because the birds of prey were seen as a, as a powerful animal. Yet probably in a natural type of setting where you look at the, um, the bunny of the field as a source of food, and as a, a mount being riven, uh, uh, ridden by the little pixies and fae people, suddenly when that uh, falcon or that eagle comes down and just swoops it up and kills it, you have both the question in the man's mind of, well, what am I going to eat tomorrow if the birds are going to eat all my food? And also, what is the, what are the fae going to ride if these uh, birds come in? I talked about in the first uh, episode how people just naturally would trade up to stronger gods, and I think you're going to see a lot of that. By the 4th and 5th centuries AD, uh, Christianity had converted most of the uh, Celts, and you start to see them as a society uh, waning and disappearing. Elements of their language still exist, but not much else. The warrior state of feudalism is taking fully over. Uh, witches are fully punished. The last Celts, amazingly, are Morgana and the Lady of the Lake. It's sort of that symbolic transfer of the Celtic traditions and it, there was a different life lesson being taught by the Arthurian tales and the last of the Fae, the last of the Celts, the last of the Elves of avoiding conflict. No, it's all gone. 
the uh, injuring of the woodlands, the, the secrets that are not to be shared. You, uh, you actually have, uh, you know, uh, Arthurian traditions where um, certain swords were grabbed up by knights and they could turn invisible. It was uh, basically a punishment that the Fae uh, was, uh, was giving to man because they knew an invisible knight would never be honorable. He would always be prone to mischief. And of course, all your druids should have some sort of invisibility as well. They can be the voice from behind. They could be in, uh, taunting or advising, or warning other of your enemies. You, uh, Gawain and the Green Knight is another big tale in Arthurian legend, and the Green Knight is definitely uh, a, a person who could represent the, the planting and fertility and the tree, and he would be sort of like enjoining between the Christian uh, knight warrior class and this last of the druid warriors inspired by the, uh, the men who trained uh, the, the fighters of nature. And one last thing before I conclude here, hope I didn't go too long or bore you all, but the Middle Ages also saw a, uh, a love finally in terms of Celtic terms. The Celtics were actually more, their tradition had more of natural, not lustful love, but uh, romantic love. And that started to become adopted. You can see in, in Tristan and his soul uh, that you see the morphed image of the man not falling for the fae this time, but falling into a forbidden love affair. It's a woman who's pledged to a king to secure a treaty, yet having loved others before that betrothal, um, they just can't resist the temptation of fulfilling that love. And uh, it wasn't really until the Renaissance that you start seeing a true unrequited love appear in the sagas and the literatures, but uh, there was always this natural attraction everyone could understand in beauty, and just this lustful uh, pagan hunger, and this uh, idea that women uh, were, were to be worshipped and not uh, punished. Until next time, those were the Celts.